Seems like there are no original ideas anymore. Everything these days is just a reboot or a sequel or a remake. Even outside Xbox is a gritty reboot of Knight Rider. Jane's the car, if you're wondering. That's why beautiful and unique ideas should be celebrated, but what you might not realise is that several beloved, original video games only narrowly avoided being sequels to existing franchises. We present to you seven iconic original games that were very nearly boring sequels. So, you must be the handyman who'll take any dirty job, am I correct? Almost. I only take special jobs, if you know what I mean. You're the man who lost a mother and a brother to evil 20 years ago. The son of the legendary Dark Knight Sparta, Mr. Dante. It says something about how good the Resident Evil series is that not only is Resident Evil 4 one of the most beloved games of all time, but also that the cancelled version of Resident Evil 4 was repurposed to become Devil May Cry, a similarly iconic series that is now six entries deep. The way the story goes is that Resident Evil head honcho Shinji Mikami wanted ideas for a new Resident Evil game from Hideki Kamiya, the developer now best known for Beautiful Joe, Bayonetta, and blocking people on Twitter. Hi to everyone in North America, and especially all the cute babes. Kamiya being, well, the guy who would go on to make Bayonetta, wanted to make a game that was cool and full of stylized action, which, as you'll know if you've played a Resi game, isn't really Resident Evil's bag. It's more of a limp around a mansion getting your ass kicked by dogs kind of a bag. Elements of Kamiya's Resident Evil 4 would go on to be partially retooled into Wesker's story in Resident Evil 5. The Wesker children were entrusted with endless potential. Created with Capcom writer Noboru Sugimura, the story would have focused on protagonist Tony Redgrave and his twin brother Paul, the sons of Umbrella Corporation mastermind Oswell E. Spencer, who have become superhumans through the use of the progenitor virus. Presumably appalled at the idea of a Resident Evil game being cool, Mikami gradually persuaded the team to make the game independently from the Resident Evil series, at which point the trademarks of the Devil May Cry series started to appear, such as the main character's name Dante, taken from the poet Dante Alighieri, and juggling enemies with your weapon which was inspired by a bug discovered during development on Onimusha Warlords. And voila, Capcom now had two great games instead of just one. Man, I wish my failed attempts at things turned out as good as Devil May Cry. Most of the time it's just burned toast. What do you call a Prince of Persia game without a prince that's not set in Persia? If you answered Assassin's Creed, then congratulations, you know your stuff. Or at least you were paying attention when it was written on screen 20 seconds ago. Back in 2003, following the launch of Prince of Persia The Sands of Time, game director Patrice Desolet set to work on a new Prince of Persia for the upcoming new generation of consoles that would, in the fullness of time, turn out to be the Xbox 360 and the PlayStation 3. The greater power of the new consoles gave the developers new opportunities to translate the acrobatic but linear platforming of Prince of Persia into an open world setting. It also made possible the concept of social stealth, since the new machines could handle over a hundred characters on screen at once, where the sands of time could only do a handful. There's no blending into this crowd. You're the dad. Over the course of development, the game that would become Assassin's Creed, known then as Prince of Persia Assassins, starred an assassin slash bodyguard who would rescue a computer-controlled prince character from mortal danger. Would this have been a string of terrible escort quests protecting a hapless prince from enemy assassins around every corner? Or would it have been good? There's no way to be sure because by the time the game debuted its first trailer in 2006, it had dumped its prince, ditched the Prince of Persia franchise, and been reimagined as Assassin's Creed, a new property for a new console generation. Along the path to becoming its own game and not a Prince of Persia sequel, Assassin's Creed of course also picked up a science fiction framing device wherein you're playing the genetic memories of a modern bartender descended from an old-timey assassin named Altair. Where am I? You're inside the Animus. Which is... It's a projector that renders genetic memories in three dimensions. 
Whereas Prince of Persia, The Sands of Time had a framing device wherein the prince had an occasionally terrible memory for things like whether he died or not. Wait, wait, wait. That's not how it happened. Now where was I? I'm the same myself. Always forgetting my keys. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be honest, video games have been ripping off 1986 movie Aliens for years now. Just check out Xenophobe from 1987. In space, no one can hear you serve a cease and desist. There were, of course, some official Aliens licensed games, even before 2013's dreadful Aliens Colonial Marines came along and ruined it for everyone. Released games included versions for the Commodore 64 home computer and a Japanese-only release for the MSX. Exactly as I remember that scene from the film. What you might not know, though, is that one of the most iconic, celebrated original games of all time, Doom, for the briefest period, started life as an Aliens tie-in game. According to famous game developer John Romero, one of the minds behind Doom, when the team at id Software were coming up with ideas for a game to follow legendary FPS Wolfenstein 3D, they discussed making a licensed Aliens tie-in for about an hour. Probably about the same amount of time that Gearbox spent on concepting Colonial Marines, to be fair. Much as the idea of id Software making a first-person Aliens game sounds incredible, if Romero and Carmack had gone the Aliens route, we'd have been robbed of the brilliance of the Doom series. Arguably, it might not even have been the phenomenon it later became if it wasn't an original game, particularly if there'd been more emphasis on the license and less on, say, multiplayer deathmatch. Still, there are some similarities that remain, most notably the blend of science fiction and horror, and the fact that the protagonist of Doom was also a space marine. And if you're still mourning the loss of an Aliens-themed Doom game, you'll be pleased to hear that one of the most high-profile mods for Doom was called Aliens Total Conversion, and added new levels, weapons, and, of course, enemies inspired by James Cameron's movie. We didn't know it at the time, but the Total Conversion mod gave us a glimpse of what this proposed id Software Aliens game might have looked like, at least until 20th Century Fox issued a cease and desist and had the mod pulled from the internet. Well. I retract my previous joke about cease and desists. And also any jokes about 20th Century Fox. Hello, Mr. Shen. Or should I say, Officer Shen. You don't need me to tell you that Grand Theft Auto is popular. From where you're sitting right now, you can probably see at least three copies of a Grand Theft Auto game. You see? Everywhere. And with Grand Theft Auto's huge success came huge amounts of imitators, all looking to siphon off a little of that GTA money for themselves. Some were successful in their own right, like Saints Row, while others were less so, like Konami's Crime Life Gang Wars. Hovering somewhere around the middle of the pack was the True Crime series, which asked the question, what if Grand Theft Auto, but you were the cops? Which is sort of misunderstanding the appeal of Grand Theft Auto, but fine, whatever. There are two games in the series, True Crime Streets of New York and True Crime Streets of LA, which is probably best remembered for the minigame in which Snoop Dogg gets deputized as a police officer and goes around randomly shooting and arresting people. You lucky I ain't showing you my strong pimp hand. And there the series ends. Or does it? No, it doesn't. That's because there was a third true crime game in development at Activision by United Front Games called True Crime Hong Kong that would have starred a new protagonist going undercover with the triads. When you're with the triads, you will have to think like them and kill like them. It looked great from the trailer, but Activision, unwilling to keep going up against Rockstar and losing, cancelled the game in 2011 after three years of development at a point when it was basically finished. But Activision's loss was Square Enix's game as they purchased the publishing rights, renamed it Sleeping Dogs, gave United Front the resources for a quick polish, and then released one of the best open-world crime games of all time. Show these mother what it means to be son on ye! That's what worries me. You're one of them. What set Sleeping Dogs apart was that it did so many different things so well. The main character, Wei, was extremely likable, and the story was gripping and full of memorable characters. You know, 15 years to do that. You know, we're not kids anymore. Whatever, man. 
Ask anyone. Jackie Ma still looks good. Mechanically, the game was fun as hell to play, with excellent arcadey driving, super cool John Woo style slow motion gunplay, and the best melee combat system outside of the Batman Arkham games, filled with bone breaking special moves and brutal environmental takedowns. Oh, and I haven't even mentioned the DLC, in which Wei goes to an Enter the Dragon style fighting tournament on a secret island full of kung fu treachery. Only one can be champion. This is insane. Or the one where he fights Chinese hopping vampires. It's got my niece! Save her way! All of which would have been replaced by a bit where Snoop Dogg drives around Kowloon Bay on a Segway if it had stayed in the true crime franchise, probably. I think we can all agree we dodged a bullet. <laughs> Sound the alarm! She's here! Lights out! Oh! GoldenEye 007 on N64 is undeniably one of the most influential and beloved games never to get a direct sequel. And unlike Bloodborne, Sony, there's actually a good reason for it. With GoldenEye an enormous critical and sales success, the Rare Development team's next game was all set to be a direct sequel to GoldenEye, based on the next movie in the series, Tomorrow Never Dies. That is until publisher EA, clearly keen to capitalise on the new positivity surrounding a brand that previously only your dad cared about, outbid Nintendo for the rights. Which is how we ended up with a game that was available on PlayStation rather than N64, that was third person instead of first person, and was single player only rather than also a brilliant multiplayer game. Will a skiing level make up for it? <laughs> yeah, thought not. Meanwhile, with James Bond off the table, Rare decided to create its own first-person spy title, starring original character Joanna Dark, a game known as Perfect Dark. <laughs> or if I'm behind the controls, a game known as Bang Average Dark. Perfect Dark played very similarly to Goldeneye and was undeniably an expansion of what the team had learned from making that game. But with its own IP, Rare was freed from the shackles of the James Bond universe. That meant a new futuristic setting to explore, more sci-fi weaponry to play with, and a pantsless alien called Elvis. I don't... I don't believe it! Elvis? What is it? Hey, I didn't say all the ideas were gold. Perfect Dark might not be remembered as fondly as Goldeneye, but it sold well enough to spawn a series of games. That included Xbox 360 launch title Perfect Dark Zero, and continuing the trend of refusing to name a game Perfect Dark 2, there's allegedly a new Perfect Dark reboot coming out for Xbox, called Perfect Dark. Though given that it was revealed way back in 2020, and we heard in 2023 that the game was still in pre-production, we're not holding our breath for it. Did you find the answers you were looking for? Agent Dark? Not yet. This is just the beginning. Maybe this is just the beginning was a subtle hint that they hadn't actually started making the game yet. The original Donkey Kong arcade game introduced not only Donkey Kong and Mario, but gave us all a glimpse into the daily dangers faced by skyscraper construction workers. It's a miracle any of them make it home alive. Of course, Donkey Kong's lasting legacy is that it established the almighty Mario video game universe, which almost didn't happen because this game was nearly about Popeye, the cartoon sailor, spinach like a and forearm gigantism spokesmodel whose popularity peaked somewhere around the late 1930s. You know what I told you? I wanted a soldier. I'm Popeye the Sailor Man. It was around the character of Popeye, as well as his girlfriend Olive Oil and ape-like nemesis Bluto, that Shigeru Miyamoto designed the game that would end up being Donkey Kong. And while the project was approved, discussions to get the Popeye license from owner King Features stalled. So, Miyamoto and Nintendo scrambled to repurpose the planned game with new characters. Thus Popeye became Mario, Bluto became Donkey Kong, and Olive Oil became Pauline. Presumably these barrels also used to contain spinach, which is why we're avoiding them now. Because Mario hates spinach, for legal reasons. Nintendo did eventually sort the rights to Popeye a year later in 1982 and released a Popeye game, but by that point, Everyone had Mario Mania, and so that was the direction Nintendo went with for their future games. 
which seems to have worked out for them. That said, I really do think Super Popeye Kart could have been a goer. Have a think about it, Nintendo. Of course, Mario's been going for so long now that the exact same thing happens to him, and games that start off as vehicles for everyone's favourite mustachioed plumber get retooled into exciting new games with nary a plunger in sight. One such example is Splatoon, a colourful game set in a fictional world in which trendy squid children fight to cover the largest amount of the floor in ink, with the reckless abandon of someone who's never had to clean up after themselves in their entire lives. Such is the cultural clout of Mario over at Nintendo, however, that these hip neon inklings were almost Mario, Luigi, Peach and the rest of the gang instead of cool octopus kids. It's easy to see how this could happen. Mario is no stranger to stepping outside of his platforming comfort zone, as anyone who's played Mario Kart, Mario Party or Paper Mario can attest, and Splatoon's key mechanic, spraying paint everywhere, is just an inversion of the main mechanic seen in Super Mario Sunshine, in which Mario is armed with a water cannon used to clean paint off things. Then there's the fact that shoving Mario into a video game is a surefire way to make sure it actually sells copies. Shigeru Miyamoto himself has said that the internal debate within Nintendo over whether to make Splatoon a Mario game was at least in part inspired by the fact that establishing new franchises is hard and slapping Mario on a box all but guarantees it'll sell well. Fortunately for Splatoon, braver heads prevailed and the game released with entirely new characters and an original story in which all humans drowned due to rising sea levels and sea creatures evolved into a humanoid form to occupy what little land was left and eventually became the inklings we're familiar with today. Well, I can see why Nintendo were worried. Thank you so much for watching this video about video games that very nearly ended up as boring sequels. Uh, if you'd like more of this sort of thing, or well, we make them all the time, so definitely subscribe and maybe like the video to tell YouTube that it's a good thing. But also, we have videos up here, one from us and one from our sequel, Outside Extra. Nothing boring about them though, promise.